gigantic, a full-sized Kendrick Perkins, and that is not a comment <laughs> on how in shape you've been trying to get lately, Perk. I'm just saying the Christmas decorations are fantastic. <laughs> we had to show you off in the big, big screen. Richard Jefferson is going to be joining us later in the show. Zach Lowe is going to be stopping by, as well as our Rockets insider, Tim McMahon, who will give us the latest from Houston on the status of James Harden, who has yet to report to training camp. So yeah, we'll, we'll talk about all that. <laughs> Stick around. First, though. So a funny piece of video of LeBron James surfaced yesterday. Here it is, if you haven't seen it. LeBron on the 405 freeway here in Los Angeles. Convertible top down. He shows off the acceleration on a limited edition Porsche Spider. There's a joke in there somewhere about sports cars and men approaching 40. Although, honestly, there's been a lot of news surrounding LeBron in the past few days. And while it does paint a picture of where LeBron is in his life right now, it's actually decidedly not a picture of someone hitting a midlife crisis. Instead, it's obvious that LeBron is one of those athletes who, as he reaches the back half of his 30s, has gotten more clarity on who he, want, who he wants to be, what he wants to do. After changing teams three times in eight years, he is now decisively settled in Los Angeles, a partnership he cemented with a contract extension last week. It's a deal that does more than just tie him to this team and this place. It effectively lays out his succession plans. One, from him to Anthony Davis, but also two, from him to his son, Bronny. As LeBron confirmed yesterday, he purposely lined that contract up with when Bronny will graduate high school and possibly be eligible for the NBA himself. There's also the clarity that LeBron has reached off the court. It was back in Miami that LeBron started to develop into an activist, dipping his toe into this cause or that. But now that side of himself is fully formed as he's created entire organizations for causes he believed in. His school in Akron, Ohio, the More Than the Vote campaign that he started just this summer. Something that yesterday earned him a record third nod as Sports Illustrated Sports Person of the Year. But most of all, what you notice with LeBron right now is his overall ability to see the big picture. Last night, the Road Trip and Podcast that is co-hosted by our friend Richard Jefferson here released a conversation with LeBron that included a section about Kyrie Irving and Kyrie's declaration that Kevin Durant is the first teammate he can trust as much as himself to make a clutch shot at the end of a game. Here is what LeBron had to say about all that. I was a little like, like, damn. Yeah. Once I got the whole transcript, I was like, damn. You know, I wasn't like, oh, you tripping. I hit yeah. game winning shots my yeah. whole life. I was not like that. I was like, damn, because um, you, you were there for a couple seasons. I, I mean, I played with Kyrie for three seasons. The whole time while I was there, um, I only wanted to see him be an MVP of our league. I only cared about his success. It, it, it kind of hurt me a little bit. Notice that LeBron makes the distinction that he didn't say, oh, you're tripping, I've hit game-winning shots my whole life. He didn't treat any of it like an argument on the blacktop. Instead, he had a much deeper reaction about his relationship with Kyrie as a whole. The support he felt he gave Kyrie through their time together and the way he's seen Kyrie rebel against that in the time since. LeBron showed the same sort of perspective when the conversation turned to who the best player of all time is. LeBron didn't take shots at anyone else. Instead, he said this. You know, the conversation is going to always be, be had, and, and it's great for debates because they want to compare errors, they want to compa compare players and, and, and who they've seen. The one thing that I know for sure, that I've been a part of two teams that's won the two hardest championships in NBA league history. The 2016 Cavs coming back from 3-1 versus 73-9 and team, being down 3-1 versus one of the best teams that ever been assembled. Two-time MVP. Two-time MVP. Um, and then what we went through in the bubble. And if you were not in a bubble, you don't quite understand it. You would never, <clears throat> ever understand how hard it was to win that championship, to be able to motivate yourself, to be out of, this is literally out of your whole comfort zone. You can debate who's the greatest of all time individually, things of that nature and what they've done. But as far as the teams, that's one of the two hardest championships in league history I've been a part of that. You can agree or not with LeBron's take here. As someone who was in the bubble, I can certainly vouch it presented mental challenges I'd never seen before in my 20 plus years covering this sport. But regardless of where you come down on the specifics, it's impossible not to notice the assurance that LeBron has now when he's talking about all of this. He's not hiding from the GOAT conversation or anything else. He's not searching the way he sometimes was earlier in his career. That Porsche convertible, it's not a midlife crisis. It's a joyride for LeBron.
who is entering this season with the clarity that can only come from having been around the block. All right, guys. LeBron's comments about whether we should be calling his 2016 or 2020 titles the toughest ever in NBA history, that prompted a lot of discussion. So stick around. Find out what our guys think about it here. First, though, it's time for our distant replay. Welcome back to The Jump. Look who came to join us, Richard Jefferson. Hi. We just played some clips, <laughs> RJ, of your conversation with LeBron James, with Channing Fry and Allie Clifton. And one of the things that caught a lot of people's attention was him calling the 2016 title and the 2020 title the toughest ever in NBA history. Now, I will certainly give him that 2016 title because he had to play with you. So that automatically <laughs> just, right? I mean, yes. that's yes. that's inarguable now. And of course, yeah. yeah, coming back from 3-1 for the first time in finals history and a two-time MVP. But the fact that you were in that, that, that that's off the table. But this 2021 too, with the bubble, we've heard, Richard, you and I have had people say to us, what do you mean the bubble was hard? Come on, millionaires staying in a luxury hotel, blah, blah, blah. What did you make when he said that to you? Well, I believed him because, Rachel, you and I were there. We saw... There was no home court. There was no like, oh, our cr home crowd is going to pick us up. There were no fans there to have that excitement. So everything that you had to muster, it was internally. It was how much did you have inside of you to go out there with no friends, no uh, like very limited family members that couldn't cheer. There was nothing there for you to build off on other than just what you can go and accomplish. And, and also I was reminded uh, by our producer that they won a championship uh, in a shortened year, in a lockout year. So if you had to break down coming back from 3-1, playing in a bubble and winning a lot and winning via a lockout where you don't have as much time to prepare, your bodies can, can decondition, show me some lies. If there's another example of a tougher championship from a unique uh, space, I, I haven't seen it. What do you think, Perk? Well, I, I, look, Richard, listen, I think LeBron didn't tell no lies, but what, I mean, a glass of wine and RJ gets all the tea from LeBron James, and you got to love it. <laughs> when you look at what he did in 2016, Rachel, like, you're right. That's one of the greatest championships in NBA history and in sports history, in my opinion. And when you talk about what he did down in the bubble, we saw all the guys jokingly talk about how when they left the bubble, they just finished doing the bid and how mentally <laughs> tough it was and how they was happy to be home and went on vacation to their favorite restaurants and you had to be mentally tough so I see no lies that LeBron James has said when he said this is two of the toughest championships in NBA history and he was part of it and it's real. Well I like approaching the greatest of all time conversation from this perspective only in that we've looked the three of us have talked about this plenty right People are great in different ways in different eras. It's just a fact. And you can go back to Wilt and Kareem, and, and everyone has such recency bias. But there were a lot of guys who played in this league who have been exceptional. And LeBron emphasizing the ways he has been exceptional, I think, is the right way to talk about mm -hmm. him versus Michael Jordan or anything else that you'd want to compare. I also want to mm -hmm. circle back with you, though, Richard, about his reaction to Kyrie saying that KD is the first teammate that he, he's ever had, that he can be trusted to close out big games. LeBron said he was hurt by Kyrie's comments. Were you surprised when you heard that on the pod? No, because everybody that knows him, and, and one of the big criticisms of him is sometimes his body language or sometimes he gets too emotional uh, in certain moments. We see it when he's frustrated, it's all over his face. So we know him to be an emotional player. And that's something that he constantly talks about having to work on, his body language and his emotion. So when he says that, I think that was probably the most accurate way. Like Perk and I and all of us get on here and we start doing all of our talk and back and forth and what is he saying? But from a player to player space, he said it. He goes, that kind of hurt me a little bit. It was like, you know, you know, during the finals, this, sitting down with Kevin Durant, and that's fine, but it's just like... That just, you know, you can you can lift somebody up without tearing somebody down. And and I don't think Kyrie's intentions were to tear him down. And my my intentions 
on asking this question wasn't to cause any riff or drama. I just want to know, like, when you heard this and you heard all of the stuff that was being said and then you listened to the content, what was your emotion? And I think that really humanized it to be like, yo, it doesn't matter that I'm, I, I'm on my way to try and win another championship or I've, I've accomplished X amount. To hear a brother, a former teammate, somebody that I wanted nothing but positive things for, to kind of shoot that, that shot, it hurt him. And, and I think that that's the best way for him to describe. And I think that's the most accurate way from a player to player to describe it. There was no, there was no, Oh, that's BS there. He didn't attack Kyrie. He just said like, look, we didn't align. And, and hearing that statement hurt a little bit. And Perk, what about for you? Well, well, look, I said this, I said this when the podcast first came out, when Kyrie made this comment, I said that Kyrie Irving is a bona fide hater. And I'm going to tell you why. The reason being is the timing of the podcast. And it look, they were sitting back at home, him and old Kevin Durant, watching LeBron James on the verge of winning his fourth title, and they couldn't stomach it. That's just the honest truth, and they were sitting back, and they was just trying to figure out a way to rub him the wrong way. To me, I was on the team when and when they first got assembled, when I was playing in Cleveland, I think in 2015, yep. and LeBron didn't do nothing but try to take Kyrie under his wing and show him the ropes, Rachel. And I was there, so no one could tell me that it was anything different. So you know, it, it's just sad to see it. And if I'm LeBron James, I'm hurt also. But I was just happy to see that LeBron took the high road because he could have said so many more things uh, on the podcast. But I'm glad he took the high road and was the bigger person. Hey, one, one, more, one more thing, Rachel, and I'll, yeah. I'll say this. Those things being said when they said. Now, we remember Bron throwing that ball to, to Danny Green and him missing that shot. Let's say that Bron were to take a shot. Everybody – and take a shot and miss a shot in a clutch moment in the finals. Everybody then would jump on the statement that Kyrie said. See, this is what Kyrie's talking about. See, this is what Kyrie's talking about. And, again, I'm not saying that Kyrie – like was was like, hey, I'm gonna take a shot at Braun, but you still have to be aware of the things that you're saying and how they're going to be perceived. So like to have that be said during the finals when players are under the most pressure to almost add a little bit of fuel to that pressure and saying, I, I've only played with one other guy that can knock down that shot while one of your former teammates is in the finals. You're inadvertently putting mm. more pressure on him to knock down a shot or else it's going to be used as criticism and your statement is going to be used as proof. So I definitely agree with you, Richard, that the timing was an issue about probably why. And look, we heard it. LeBron say to you, like the timing was part of what really messed him up about it and how he felt about what Kyrie said. And I agree also, by the way, if you are someone who gets paid all of this money, not just to play basketball, frankly, but to have a signature shoe and be in movies and market yourself. You have to have an understanding that you get paid all of that money because your words carry weight. So it means your words carry weight and you have to then have responsibility for what you say and when mm -hmm. you say it. I don't agree with you, though, Perk, that Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving weren't sitting around during the finals being like, oh, LeBron's getting too much attention. How can we get some of that? You don't think that really happened, do you? Well, Rachel, look, this is what I'm telling you. Just think of it, the timing, right? Just think of it. Both of those guys were not in the bubble. It's Kevin Durant podcast. And at that time, they decided to do a podcast with Kyrie and actually release that clip while LeBron was on the verge of doing something special and playing phenomenal basketball. I always say this. You know my saying. You can't tell me the sky is green and the grass is blue and expect me to believe it. I stand by what I be how I believe and how I feel, Rachel. That's how I feel. All right. Well, I know what color this guy is. What about you, Richard? Uh, well, I, I don't think that, <laughs> again, I, I don't know if they were sitting around, but I, I like, again, we're going to keep saying the timing of it is very, very difficult to justify. And look, those weren't the only controversial things that were said in that podcast. There was a lot of things that needed to be addressed. Right. And and this was just one of them. And, and I'm glad that, you know, Braun came on. And to your point, Perk, he didn't come out and kill him. He didn't come out and talk a bunch of trash. He said he was hurt. And he said that all he wanted was positive things for Kyrie. That's definitely taking the high road. Absolutely. All right, guys. We'll put this behind us. There's a whole other drama we have to discuss. James Harden reportedly <laughs> eyeing a trade to Philadelphia after his request to join the Nets. Has it's kind of uh, there's some moving parts to it, I assume. But. Uh, him getting tested in Houston is good for everybody. 
you know, trust is built day to day. And once the relationship begins, then we'll, we'll begin that process of trust. The good thing that I have here, and one of the reasons that I am, I was so excited to get this job is like, we're not in a rebuilding situation, you know, ownership and Rafael have done a great job of putting a really good team together, adding John Wall, adding Cousins, adding Wood, and now adding James to that is still very exciting. Steven Silas, by the way, for a rookie head coach, very impressive throughout these whole last few days. And I want to welcome in our ESPN NBA reporter down to Texas, Tim McMahon, who's been right on top of this story. Uh, judging from what you heard from Silas and company today, when do the Rockets expect to see James Harden at practice? Well, that, that depends on when he clears the NBA's COVID protocols, and Steven Silas isn't quite sure, but... Obviously, the good news for the Rockets is James Harden is in Houston. He did report to the Toyota Center, so the process has begun to get him cleared to be able to practice with the team. And, you know, the Rockets all along anticipated that this would happen at some point. Of course, they thought he'd be there for the start of camp, and they thought he'd be there yesterday. <laughs> Imagine that. A couple days late, little Vegas vacation. Hey, little Vegas vacation. In some ways, it's, quote, James being James, but obviously... Uh, with the situation of him having requested to be traded, it, it is different than some of his previous Vegas vacations, his annual post-All-Star stop in Vegas and miss a practice situations. And, and I always like to point out for the people watching that, quote, holdouts, they, they don't work in the NBA. They don't work the way they would in the NFL. An NFL player can hold out and the clock on his contract continues. He's just not getting paid. In the NBA, the clock on your contract doesn't start until you report. So holding out doesn't do anything for a guy because it just pushes his attachment to the team that he might be holding out from for even longer. He can ask for a trade, though, and you reported the addition, Tim, of the Sixers to Harden's list of trade targets. What is the Rockets' reaction to this, especially since the man that they would be dealing with to make this trade would be Daryl Morey, who told them that he wanted to take a year or so off from basketball. They let him out of his contract, and a week later it turned out that he wanted to take what it, well, you have called it a gap week instead of a gap year and showed up in Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah, and look, is it is it maybe awkward if they get into serious discussions? Sure. To be clear, to this point, there have been not there have not been any real significant discussions between the Rockets and Sixers. And what Harden has said is, look, Brooklyn is still his preference. He would certainly be open to the Sixers or other contending situations. But it's, there's just a short list of teams that fit both his criteria of a contender and that can also give the Rockets the you know franchise cornerstone and bundle of either young talent or draft picks and or draft picks in return and obviously that's where you get to the 76ers as a, as a partner that could make sense important to note however Daryl Morey has been absolutely adamant that he is not interested in breaking up that duo of Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons and obviously, if you're talking about a young franchise cornerstone, if one of those guys aren't coming back to Houston, there, there's no discussions to be had. Yeah, and, and look, Tim, we talked about the fact that you can't really hold out, right, in the NBA. And I loved your reporting at the beginning of all of this when the reports were out that Harden wanted to trade, and then you talked to the Rockets, and they said that they were willing to get uncomfortable what kind of message do you think James Harden has been trying to send these past few days about how uncomfortable this might actually get in terms of what they ask for or wish for? Oh, we've lost him. I don't know. I can ask our guys about what message James Harden has been trying to send. I'll bring back in Richard Jefferson and Kendrick Perkins here. Guys, as I said to Tim and started to talk about, um, he said, hey, uh, we're willing, the Rockets said, hey, we're willing to get uncomfortable. Well, there was a reporting date for the Rockets, and James Harden was first in Atlanta with Lil Baby, and then he was reportedly in Las Vegas. What message do you think that he's been trying to send? I, I think that, that James Harden is okay with being uncomfortable also. <laughs> I, I think that's the message. He's like, yo, mm. that's fine. You guys can be uncomfortable. I'm okay with making this uncomfortable. Now, this is the thing. Is there a level of professionalism that you want all players to to have? Yes, but I think James, if he's behaving like this, 
then you have to believe that he has communicated to them that he does not really want to show up to camp, that he would prefer to be traded before camp starts. And so if they didn't take that in and they're saying, listen, you're under contract, you have to show up, then he's like, okay, well, I'm going to show up on my own time. And this can continue to get uglier on both sides, not just on his side. So hopefully they can come up with some sort of agreement. Well, it's interesting, uh, RJ, that you brought up that James Harden and, and the Rockets have communication. It's a lack of communication that was going on. And it started from the top of the hiring of the GM and the hiring of Steve Silas. Uh, from my understanding, it didn't get the approval from James Harden. But with that being said, you still have to show up to work. And I think James is at fault, not for requesting a trade or wanting a different, uh, a different scenery, but for him not showing up to work, like this is your job. You get paid to do it. I always look back on the Anthony Davis situation and Anthony Davis, although he wanted out and wanted to go to LA, he still showed up to work every day. And also this is a learning, this is a learning situation for Tim and for Tita also that you have to have great communication with your franchise guys moving forward, especially when Dal Morey uh, <clears throat> left the organization. So right now it's just a big mess down here in Houston. I don't know how the locker room could accept all this right now, but Let's see how it go. I see Steven Silas is doing a great job, by the way, of handling all this. Absolutely. Who would you guys say has the leverage right now in this situation? Because James still has two years left on his deal. But as we've seen, it can be disruptive if a player doesn't want to be somewhere. What do you think, Richard? I, I, I think... I... I don't think anyone wins in these type of battles. I don't think anyone wins. I think James Harden mm. obviously, you know, gets uh, affected in the public perception. Again, there was already a public perception about, you know, his partying and stuff like that. I'm not going to say that this man isn't a professional and didn't approach. You know, we know he's one of the best players probably to ever walk the face of this planet. But when you're out doing that, when training camp is supposed to start, then that's a, that just adds to the public perception. And that actually generates money, whether you're talking about shoe sales, whether you're talking about further contracts. And so I, I think with the Houston Rockets, they have a little bit of leverage, like, hey, we're gonna make you show up. But what message does that send to future free agents if you're unhappy? Right. So this is one of those things that everyone loses in this situation. And it's best if you can't sit down, if Tim can't sit down and have a, a conversation with James Harden, and if they can't leave that meeting with an idea that he's going to start and see how this goes, then they have to have the conversation about how you can move on from, from him and, and, and try and get your team as much assets as possible. Right. And, and Rachel, to answer your question, who has all the leverage? All the teams that's going to be calling in has the leverage. <laughs> because if I'm Philly, or I'm the, if I'm Philly, if I'm the Brooklyn Nets, guess what? The, the package that I would have presented three weeks ago, I, I'm not forced to present that package now because of how James Harden has cared and, and handled this situation by not reporting. He's almost forcing his hand, which is going to force the Rockets. And so now they're going to have to be forced to take anything with three weeks ago they probably could have got back a Ben Simmons or something to that nature along with some picks but if I'm Dal Moore for example and I'm the Philadelphia 76ers I'm holding tight I'm offering them a package but it ain't including Ben Simmons and, and look you know some of the emotions involved here too we know how James feels right now or we certainly have gotten indications of that but look once he gets into it james is known as a workhorse right he's been an iron man mm -hmm. for the rackets he loves playing basketball mm -hmm. they've had a hard time getting him to sit so i know one of the things the rackets are banking on is that once he gets into it whether it be training camp or actually starting to play games and plays with john wall and plays with boogie cousins that it might ease the situation a little bit and then give the rackets a little bit more breathing room to actually make a better deal we will find out coming up there's more deals to talk about. Will Giannis sign the Supermax extension in these next two weeks before the December 21st deadline? We will preview the Bucks season next on The Jump. But first, we have season tips off in just 14 days. We are counting down the days until opening night by previewing a team a day. Today, we take an in-depth look at the club that finished with the best regular season record in the NBA the last two seasons. Oh, yes, it's time for Previously on the Milwaukee Bucks. The 2020 Kia Most Valuable Player is Giannis Atetokounmpo. The trophy's right behind me. I'm going to ship it to Greece. No, no, don't, don't do that. I'm going to come get it. 
He earned this award. He was the best player in the regular season. And now the playoffs, different story. There is no sugarcoating how the Bucks season ended last night. A Milwaukee team with legit championship aspirations was bounced from the playoffs in the second round by a five seed. This is a franchise that ain't won nothing since 1973. 1973. Hopefully you can build a, a culture in Milwaukee that uh, for many years that we can come out here and compete every single year for, uh, for a championship. And I think when he says, you know, I'm not ducking this, we have to get better, he's saying I have to get better. It's almost decision time for Giannis Antetokounmpo. The Bucks knew they had to improve their team. Certainly Drew Holiday, uh, a major upgrade for them in the backcourt. Drew Holiday was a must for them. And it should have been a breath of fresh air for Giannis. Bogdan Bogdanovich, he appeared to be headed to the Bucks via sign and trade earlier this week, only to decide to opt for restricted free agency instead. Bogdanovich never said yes. It's an embarrassing blunder, really, all across the board by everybody. Are they moves that are going to move the needle, or are they just things that names that we got in here, and we end up not being that much better than what we were before? Do you believe Giannis should sign the Supermax? But this guaranteed contract in your face, $221 million? Man, without question, yes. I don't think that there's any reason to rush into this. I'd like to see what this roster looks like and what my championship aspirations look like in Milwaukee before putting pen to paper. In the rarefied air the Bucks want to operate in, playoff success is the only thing that matters. And Milwaukee took a jarring step backward. Change has to happen, and it has to happen soon. All right, we have another guest joining us, senior NBA writer, host of the Low Post podcast, the man who has unbuttoned and buttoned his jacket six times during the commercial break. It is our friend. <laughs> I Zach can't figure it out. How did you? How did you finally decide to go with closed? I don't know. I just said uh, we're winging it now. We're just going. All right, all right. Everyone, please chime in on Twitter with Zach's fashion sense. All right. Let's look ahead to this upcoming season. The Bucks, starting with, we've been doing this like kind of like TV show, right? So the cliffhanger from the series finale where the Bucks were bounced out of the playoffs in five games by the Heat in the second round. Since then, the Bucks have traded for Drew Holiday, offered Giannis a max extension that he has to sign before December 21st. Otherwise, it will all kick the can down the road to next offseason where he could sign it again or become an unrestricted free agent. Zach, do you think he will sign before the season's deadline? We're getting to it. Yo, Rachel, if I knew the answer to that question, don't you think I would have reported it by now? <laughs> I have no idea what he's going to do. I can tell you this. During the Drew Holiday, Bogdan Bogdanovich bonanza, the <laughs> Bucks were really optimistic. They were about ready to pop the champagne. They were super excited. They've gone kind of silent since then. I don't really know what that means. I don't know what that means, but I know that that optimism, I just haven't been hearing that. But look, if he doesn't sign it, okay, if he doesn't sign it, can you imagine the pressure that he's going to be under every single game this year? It's going to be the biggest story in the league all year long. So I don't know what he's going to do, but we've got about two more weeks to find out. Well, I think Giannis got to sign it. Listen, I understand basketball is entertainment to everyone in the outside world, but to these NBA players, this is a job, and we have to remember that, and you got to get all the money. First. Don't ever pass up on your for show thinking this is going to be some more. Now, Giannis have a long career, but right now he have $200 plus million plus in front of his face, and I believe he's going to take it. The Bucks has done everything that they supposed to do for us trying to please him. Getting Drew Holiday, I said this time and time again, was a huge uh, addition for them. And I think Giannis need to look into that, that the ownership is giving him everything that they want and trying to please him and don't turn down your money. Now look, I'm not gonna tell a player what to do with his money. That is a lot of money to turn down. At the end of the day, you know, it is it is it is next level money that that even players like myself and Perk, who played in the league for double digit years, it's hard for us to fathom that. I will say this: there's going to be a little bit less pressure on him because there are no fans. Now, follow me here. Everywhere that that Kyrie and KD and all of these.
guys would go, they would have chants from fans. Well, you know, come here. Come. You would see billboards up in cities. And there was just a tremendous amount of, like, uh, attention and pressure. I think where Giannis, if he decided to become a free agent and have to play through this season, there's not going to be fans chanting every single city he goes. You understand that there is with the social distancing, media is not going to, are not going to be in your locker. You only have a limited media availability because of COVID. So all of that, that's the pressure that people talk about. Not necessarily games. It's just going to city to city and having to listen to fans, having to listen to the media. Well, all of that's not on the table with COVID this year. So I think if he decided to become a free agent, there's actually going to be less pressure than you've seen on players like Anthony Davis or Kyrie Irving or uh, or Kevin Durant. Less pressure than we've seen on those guys. So my opinion is always take the money, but this is his life and it's his decision. That's interesting. I hadn't really thought yeah. about it, uh, the point of view without having fans in the building being a little bit different. I also think it's important that all of us in the media make sure we tell the whole story, which is He's not asking for a trade either way. He has made that clear. His representative has made that clear. This isn't a situation where Anthony Davis turned down the Supermax and then asked to get out of New Orleans earlier. He is basically deciding whether or not he makes a longer term commitment to Milwaukee or whether he's giving it one more season in Milwaukee and then deciding whether to sign the Supermax the next summer. Now, the Bucks can decide, hey, we don't want to risk giving him away for nothing. We want to trade him. But I don't think any of us expect that to happen. I think they expect to go through the season either way with him. And here are the games that Bucks fans will want to binge watch this season. The Bucks open their season December 23rd against the Celtics. They also face the Warriors on ABC Christmas Day. Zach, which game in this first half of the schedule that's been released, what do you think will be the biggest actual test for the Milwaukee Bucks? Well, those are all pretty good tests right there, but how about the team that just whipped your butt in the playoffs four games to one mm. and figured you out again just like Toronto did the year before? How about that third game against the Miami Heat? Now, they lost Jay Crowder, who was actually the primary defender on Giannis for most of that series, but they still have Bam. They still have arguably the best coach in the NBA. They just played him, and they stonewalled Giannis just like the Raptors did, and the Bucs didn't have a plan B, and they exploited the Bucs' refusal to switch in certain schemes on defense and got open threes. So, like, let's see if the Bucs learn something. Let's, let's fire that matchup right back and see if they're out for some revenge. All right. Well, finally, it's time for... Spoiler alert, Caesar Sportsbook giving the Bucks the best chance of winning the East, followed by the Nets, Celtics, and Heat in that order. So, Perk, is your bold prediction for the Bucks this upcoming regular season, where will they net out? Well, the way that they the way that pieces that they have in Giannis, Chris Middleton, Drew Holiday, along with Brooke Lopez, I wouldn't be surprised if the Bucks come out of the East this year, and that's going to be the big test. We know that what they're capable of doing in the regular season is what they're going to do in the postseason. And Andrew Holiday, a guy that could go for 40 in a playoff game and actually close out a playoff game and be a leader and actually defend and have that leadership skill, I think is huge for them. So I definitely see them that they could make it to the final. Yeah, I think I, yeah, I think Drew Holiday is a huge pickup. I, I, I really do. Now, is he going to be that third star? Like we talked about this even during the postseason. They need a closer. Giannis, as great as he is, he's almost a decoy the last sixty seconds, last two minutes because of his inability to knock down free throws at a high level and his ability to knock down shots. Like again, you look at players like Shaq. Shaq needed D Wade. Shaq needed. Kobe Bryant. He needed Penny Hardaway. He needed these players around them. Shaq would get you to 46 minutes and be the most dominant guy, but he needed a closer. Is Drew Holiday and Chris Middleton combined, are they going to be that closer for Giannis? I'm not sure. Some of those names that we just talked about, Kobe Bryant, D. Wade, uh, Penny Hardaway, I don't know if Chris Middleton and uh, Drew Holiday can be those type of closers for Giannis, but that's what's needed. Uh, to RJ's point, Drew Holiday and Chris Middleton are kind of traditional, maybe number three guys, maybe even number four guys on a championship team. They don't have a classic number two guy. But here's my bold prediction for the Bucks: Number one, they'll get the number one seed in the East and nobody will care. We've seen the movie before. <laughs> nobody cares anymore. Number two, number two, they will use the regular season more, more adroitly to prepare for the playoffs. That means we're not going to play one defense every game and one offense every game. We're not going to send Giannis into a brick wall over and over again. We're going to start to prepare early for some of the elite defenses we're going to see. That means we're going to have a lot of